Hi, this is Dr. Nick, and we're going to be finishing up this section on ECG leads, and we'll talk about the chest leads or the precordial leads. And if you can imagine, this is actually somebody's chest. It's a diagram of a chest sort of like cut down the middle in a horizontal direction so that you actually have the spine back here and the breastbone or the sternum over here. Um, uh, so just to orient you, uh, this is the uh, outside of the chest wall, and uh, inside the chest, of course, we'll find um, the heart. There it is. Uh, I've drawn this ahead of time. So uh, remember, if this is the front of the chest, then the heart is kind of rotated with the right ventricle and the right atrium towards the front, and the left atrium and left ventricle sort of towards the back of the heart, sort of posterior pointing towards the spine. We discussed this in the three-dimensional anatomy uh, video in an earlier section. Uh, so anyway, where do we put the precordial leads on? Well, of course, I did show you a video where the precordial leads go um, here, with V1 being at the, on the right sternal border, V2 being in the left sternal border, V4 being in the midclavicular line, and V3 somewhere in between, V5 on the uh, anterior axillary line of V6 being in the mid axilla sort of like I, I've drawn it so that you're um, just sort of like cutting the chest in half so that would be in the mid axillary line. So that's where the V leads go and uh, what do they record? Well these are kind of like unipolar leads. Remember unipolar leads are a single lead and you're looking at voltage movement towards or away from that lead. Now when the heart depolarizes it's the electrical system that allows for proper synchronization and uh, um, efficient depolarization and I've drawn in the cardiac conduction system here with the AV node in the septum you've got the main bundle of his a very thin right bundle coming to the right ventricle and then a large left bundle that splits into hemifascicles and other branches. So the first part of the heart to depolarize is actually the septum off of a branch of the left bundle branch. And so the initial activation of the heart in the septum traverses away from the left bundle branch anteriorly towards the right ventricle and away from the left side. So it's the first part of the electrical signal travels towards the front and away from the left side. Then, of course, the left ventricle being the much larger of the two ventricles depolarizes mainly to, down and to the left and at the very end sort of finishes in a little bit of a posterior direction. So what does that look like on the ECGs in the various chest leads? Well, in V1, well, the first thing you'll see is a P wave. Remember, the sinus node initially stimulates the right atrium, but then Bachmann's bundle conducts sig the signal to the left side, and left atrial contraction occurs a little bit later. So the signal first goes towards V1, and then later goes away from V1. And the P wave often has a kind of a biphasic appearance to it because of that reason. Then you have the PR segment, and then the QRS complex will have a very characteristic appearance because the septal depolarization toward is going towards V1. So you have an initial positive deflection, but then the left ventricle being so large and depolarizing in a posterior direction will give you mostly a deep S wave before resolving back to the baseline, and then often you'll see a T wave. And so V1 should look like this in a normal person. Now let's take V6 on the other hand. V6, what happens is the, you get a P wave that's sort of upright because it's traveling towards V6 all the time. It's traveling sort of towards the left. Um, so you'll get a fairly upright P wave. But then what happens is the first part of the QRS is going to be going away from V6 because it's the septum that's being activated. And so what you'll get is a negative deflection, a Q wave, which is known as the septal Q wave. And then what happens is the rest of the left ventricle depolarizes and it's all going towards V6. And so you get a very large R wave. And then sometimes you'll get an F S wave at the end, sometimes not, depending upon uh, exactly how the ventricle is shaped. And then, of course, the T wave comes after. So this is what V6 will look like. Everything in between will generally be 
a steady progression from one to the other. In other words, the R wave will gradually increase in size until you get this big R wave. And the S wave will gradually diminish in size until you get hardly any S wave, if any at all. Okay, so now V2 is kind of like, a lot like V1, in that you get uh, sometimes a little biphasic P wave there. And then, but the R wave should be a little bit taller and the S wave should still be negative. Now, V3 and V4 are the two leads where the, the so-called transition point generally occurs. What's the transition point? Well, that's where the, the R wave grows bigger than the S wave. So, all right, so in, in this uh, case, we'll have the transition point be at V4, which is more common, I think, than V3. You have a P wave, and then you have an R wave that's getting bigger, but the S wave is still there, and it's still a little bit bigger than the R wave. But in V4, now we've reached the transition point on the precordial leads where the R wave is bigger than the S wave. V5 will progress again towards V6. You may have a little residual um, S wave there. And then V6 will finally um, look as I've drawn it. So you can see that the R wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger across the precordium, and the S wave will gradually get smaller and smaller. And the reason that's so is because we're seeing different electrical views of the heart. As we get further around the back end of the heart, we see the ventricle growing larger and larger. Why? Because the left ventricle is indeed a posterior structure and V6 is seeing the backside of the heart a lot better than V1 is. So when you look at a 12 lead ECG, you should see this kind of R wave progression across the precordial leads. And that tells you that all the electrical signals are in their proper position. You can imagine that if the precordial leads are not in the right position, then the R wave progression will not look normal. And people will be tempted to diagnose all sorts of problems like old infarctions and crazy conduction abnormalities. So putting those leads in the proper position is definitely important. So now that we've completed our discussion of all 12 leads and you have a sense of what they should look like, we'll go on to the next section where we begin to examine real-life tracings of the P waves, the QRS complexes, and the T waves, begin to make initial measurements in terms of intervals and rate, and begin to put together an organized approach to reading ECGs, because it's important that you don't miss anything. And in order to do that, you have to have an organized approach. You have to look at the forest and then examine the trees and bit by bit, piece by piece, put the thing together and figure out what's happening physiologically so that you can make the correct diagnosis on paper. Remember, I'm here to make you an ECG expert. So keep on watching these videos and I'll get you there. This is Dr. Nick for the ECG Academy. Thanks for watching.